what I really like to do is to find out what are the secret movements under the surface of things. I was a radical as a student and when you're a student radical you, you realize that the things that are in the newspapers are just kind of window dressing. That's not what's really going on. The things that are really going on are too slow and too undramatic to make newspaper stories. You have to really be attentive to long-term trends and have a nose to look at what are the dynamics of things, what are the social dynamics of things. Every society has a set of agreements that most people in the society think are sensible and when you're really trying to think seriously you have to get away from that and you have to say well everybody believes that derivatives are wonderful financial invention and they will make everybody rich and then other people come along and say well wait a minute perhaps that's not true perhaps they're all kind of crazy and betting against each other and it's just like a casino and sooner or later it will collapse which of course we have just seen and in the ecological area uh, which is uh, a, a most concern to me, uh, things move slowly and then suddenly you realize that all the codfish are gone from the North Atlantic, for example. And many fish scientists saw it coming, uh, many people in state government saw it coming, but they were unable to control the catch of the fish until it was too late. And now all there are little tiny fish that are not worth catching. And that's a kind of a parable of the way industrial capitalism works because it exploits things till they're not worth exploiting anymore. And uh, if we continue doing that, there will be a lot of things that we can't exploit anymore and it will be very serious for us. Well, it already is. In case of an emergency, like an earthquake, actually I would be pretty useful because I am a practical fellow. Many city people are not practical in America now. They don't know how to do anything. But what I do, I am a thinker and a writer. I sometimes give a lecture that I title Ecotopia or Bust. In American history we are all taught that the pioneers crossing the plains had on their wagons the sign sometimes California or Bust or Oregon or Bust and that was it for them because if they didn't make it they would all die and be eaten by coyotes or wolves. So it was serious. Well it's serious now. So our problem really, you know, in my book Ecotopia, I called the dominant party the survivalist party, which people thought was kind of a funny term. But in actuality, that's, our, that's going to be our problem for the century. How do we survive in a, we hope, decent way? What we have to learn, I think, is you might call it intelligent austerity. One challenge is going to be to live with less because the productivity of the world industrial machine as a whole, as it has been run heretofore, is declining. And it's not just the current financial collapse, it's probably going to be peak oil and ecological degradation and loss of resources and so on. Many, many parts of the world are probably going to get much drier because of global warming. So we're going to have to learn to do farming under extremely arduous water shortage circumstances. That's already true of a lot of places. In Australia, you probably know they've been having, I think, seven-year drought by now. Their rice crop is just gone, no more rice. And uh, wheat, which is a crop that much of humanity depends upon that don't basically eat rice, is also in trouble. I think people have not yet grasped how really, really, really serious global warming is. How much it endangers not only third world countries, third world agriculture, but also the so-called advanced countries that Europe and Japan and North America and Australia and New Zealand are likely to have very, very serious trouble in the next, say, 20 years. And I think this has not yet gotten to people. And people respond well when they know there's a real problem. We have monocrop agriculture which is actually losing soil at a very serious rate. And the Midwest of the United States has some of the probably, or had in the beginning, some of the deepest and richest soil anywhere in the world. And it's slowly been washing away and blowing away and becoming less fertile 
because we treat it badly. We rely on artificial fertilizers and a lot of herbicides and pesticides which destroy the underground microbial life in the soil and reduce its ultimate fertility. So we're going to have to stop doing that. We're going to have to get back to smaller organic farms that employ more people, which will be good because we need jobs for people in the most desperate way. And uh, we are going to have to learn how to grow different crops. We're going to have to learn how to grow them differently. We're probably going to have to learn to eat a lot less meat because meat is not only very expensive, but it's very expensive in terms of petroleum and in terms of land and water use. So we have to fundamentally change the, our land use pattern. You know, New Yorkers, it's funny, people kind of look down on New Yorkers who don't live there, but New Yorkers do not have cars. They use public transportation almost universally, and they weigh six pounds less on the average than the rest of us because they walk to the subway. <laughs> so they have less of a whole range of diseases that we get by being obese. And uh, they are greener in almost every respect because when you have an apartment building, a sack of apartments, no matter how high they are, they are inherently much, much more efficient in terms of material and energy than a separate house. In fact, the ratio, if you take a square footage, you know, a thousand square foot dwelling in an apartment and compare it with a thousand square foot dwelling in a house, separate house, the house uses something like five times as much material and energy. It's, uh, it's simply, uh, we're going to have to stop that. We're going to have to make our cities a lot denser, a lot, there'll be a lot more fun, there'll be a lot more amusements, cafes, culture, education, everything that cities are so good at doing will be more concentrated and more, uh, more productive. I expect that some of these suburban areas that we've been building like out in the valley in California here will become first slums where, where, where only really poor people will live. And then gradually the buildings are built rather flimsily and they'll probably just fall down. In a few little places around shopping centers, for example, will probably develop apartments and become little working towns. Uh, but the whole automobile-driven sprawl system, which is the main thing that America has created since World War II, is probably finished. The cars are the dragon. If we don't slay the car dragon, it's going to eat us up. And people have to learn how to share cars. I'm very happy about the car sharing companies that are all over the, all over the country now in cities. But also people are just going to have to learn to share cars with their neighbors and their families and not be so individualistic about it. As well as sharing a lot of other things, tools. We're already sharing houses a lot. There are a lot of reasons why shared living is more stimulating, more informative, more entertaining, and uh, maybe even more productive than living in a tiny little studio apartment with a full range of appliances. People in America are under great stress. America is a very, very difficult place to live. And especially if you don't have a lot of advantages from your family or your education or whatnot, uh, life is very stressful, very difficult. And our family structure has sort of disintegrated, especially in the middle class, oddly enough. So that we are very alienated in the sociological term and lonely and uh, don't have too much resources for coping with trouble or uh, discouragement even. I feel that maybe we can get the country thinking of itself as a group of people who will share and cooperate and work together instead of the old dog-eat-dog -dog idea that is the official idea ideology of America. And we'll learn, we'll learn some basic things about how human beings actually operate. We are animals made up of colonies of microbes that have learned how to cooperate and form different organs and so on in order to get up and stand around and walk around and get food that isn't available on the, on the surface. So we ought to have a fellow feeling for, our, for the lowliest of our fellow inhabitants of Spaceship Earth. And then we might get some sense of uh, proportion and how we ought to run our affairs and cut down our impacts on the environment. Which may, it, it, we don't lack brains. I mean, maybe humans are not quite as smart as we like to think, but we don't lack technological brains to do a lot of things better. I mean, Silicon Valley is full of people working on photovoltaic cells and Lord knows what are the kinds of alternative energy sources. And that's not the problem. The problem is to put the capital into it and 
set up government regulations and incentives so that this stuff gets deployed rapidly. And I think we have to get a real sense of national and international urgency about this stuff. Because left to themselves, any corporate entity will emit as much badness as it can. And we would all do that. If we were sitting in corporate offices, we would behave exactly the same way. It's not that corporate people have rotten characters. It's that the structure that they work in drives them to maximize profit at the expense of everything else. And the way we get things done in this country, and I'm not sure it's that different in other countries, when we want something really important done, like winning a war or sending people to the moon or something big like that, what we do is to bribe corporations. Congress, which has control of the money, says, here is an enormous pile of money, do this. And the company says, all right, if the money is right, of course they'll do it. So what I would like to see is Congress saying to the Bechtel Corporation, for example, which is a huge construction company based here, very busy building airfields and small towns and so on in Iraq. Bechtel, forget about Iraq. We want you to build eco-cities here in America. And here's the money. And Bechtel, you know, these companies do not have ideology. They are, they are purely amoral. Karl Marx is pretty much out of fashion now, but he said some really wise things. And one of them was, capital has no country. And I didn't really understand that until recently. But if you are, for example, if you are the head of Cisco, the information technology company here, and people ask you, what is your real challenge for the next little while? He says things like, to make Cisco a Chinese company. They don't really care where Cisco is or who works for them or whether they live or die. They care whether the corporation, which is a kind of, you might say, alien organism here in the midst of us, whether it lives or dies. People who run corporations are often fine people, very moral, very nice people, but they have to do what they have to do because that's the rules of the game. If we want to have a democratic and ecologically stable country like Ecotopia, we are going to have to change the rules of the corporate game. So there are many ways in which the political structure can control corporations if it wants to. The trouble is that our political institutions are so corrupted by campaign financing problems in this country, at least, that we can't do that. So the first step is reforming American elections. And luckily, a lot of states are really realizing that this can be done. There is a system called clean elections, where it's a system of public financing, where um, candidates run with public money and are not allowed to take corporate money and are therefore free to vote in the interest of the public at large rather than the interest of the guy looking over the shoulder who you know, wrote them a check for $50,000 in the last election. So that, in a nutshell, is why I think we have not made more progress because the institutional structure is not capable of receiving and acting on changed input very much. It's still acting as if it was set up in the 19th century. And here we are in the 21st century. And we're going to have to change it. The question is whether we can change in time to prevent civilization from really contracting in an awful, awful way. Now I'm much more cynical. Now I think that things are changed only when important people get money out of it. The question is, how come we have taken all these bad paths, these, these suicidal paths, these self-defeating paths? And so to get people to realize that is a very, very, very big challenge. And, you know, you can't just give people bad news or they will get so sad and so depressed that they'll just lie down and pull the dirt in over them and say, forget it. On the other hand, you can't give them foolish hopes because then they'll, the minute they try something and get slapped down, they'll be too discouraged. So you have to be reasonably realistic about what can be done. So we are going to have to get smarter. And the question is, how do we all get smarter in everything that we are doing? And my hope is that this will get people out of the box of thinking either that the end is near, abandon all hope, the way many people actually do, including some young people, or just blindly thinking, well, somebody will take care of it, which is not too likely. 
and uh, to make people think how they have to work together to take care of some of these things. We need some very big, very big changes. So that could be quite exciting. Uh, if I live to see them all, I'll be a happy man. <laughs>